I'm Bob Lederer. We're recording this segment on April 18th, 2021. As the trial of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd moves to a conclusion, and perhaps a verdict may be announced by the time this program airs, and as the community resistance grows in the nearby suburb of Brooklyn Center in response to the outrageous murder of Dante Wright, and as the Black Lives Matter movement and the broader movement against racist police violence grows nationwide, we think it's critical to speak to local activists on the ground in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is ground zero, as it were. And we're now joined by two guests uh, via Zoom. Uh, Jay Yates is a Black trans organizer with Twin Cities Coalition for Justice for Jamar, or tcc for j which is a Black-led, queer-led, anti-police violence organization currently fighting for community control of police. Jay joined TCC4J last year as an organizer for Taking Back Pride, a protest against police and corporate presence during Pride celebrations in the Twin Cities. And uh, listeners may recall, incidentally, that we have a similar, a parallel group here in New York called the Reclaim Pride Coalition. Jay works also with the Community Aid Network Minnesota, a combination of three former pop-up mutual aid sites working to bring food and household supplies to community members, as well as supporting protesters with first aid supplies. And Jay's pronouns are they, them, and he, him. Welcome, Jay. Thanks for having me. And our second guest, Jess Sundin, is a white lesbian who's been organizing in Minneapolis for nearly 30 years, from anti-war activism to fighting government repression, specifically as a grand jury resistor. That is, a person who, along with her wife and 22 other activists in 2010, took a principled position of refusing to participate in an FBI-directed fishing expedition to gather intelligence on the radical movement. Jess Sundin joined the local fight against police terror after the 2015 police murder of Jamar Clark. Since then, she has worked with the Twin Cities Coalition for Justice for Jamar and the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression to demand justice for countless stolen lives while also building the fight for community control over the police. She lives with her wife and their teen daughter in South Minneapolis, less than a mile from where George Floyd was killed last summer, and her pronouns are she and her. Thank you, Jess, for joining us on Out of Fem. Thanks, Bob. It's great to see you again. Likewise. Folks may recall that uh, shortly after uh, Jess's subpoena to the grand jury, this is about 10 years ago, you were a guest here on Out of Fem to tell us about the um, really horrendous repression that you and your comrades had been subjected to, which included an FBI raid on your house, um, which was quite a, um, you know, a horrible experience to live through. But you, um, you certainly came out the other side victorious, and those grand jury subpoenas were withdrawn. And um, you were able to maintain the fight and not go to prison as so many others, including actually myself in 1985, and a similar investigation, um, so many others were forced to do prison time. All right, so Jay Yates, let me start with you. As the Chauvin trial nears its conclusion, how would you assess the level of organizing for justice in Minneapolis? And what are the key demands right now around that trial? And also, of course, the, um, the developing case around the murder of um, Dante Wright. And uh, also, what would you say is the, the feeling among organizers that you work with? So that's, that's a lot of questions, uh, yeah. but um, I think I would say that uh, I think the coalition that TCC for J, um, Twin Cities Coalition for Justice for Jamar organizes with um, is really uh, strong in our stance about the trial and really, um, we really know like what we are pushing for. Um, there are several pieces of legislation that um, this coalition has kind of signed on to support um, and community control police is kind of the one that TCC for J champions. Um, and I think that we really independently of the outcome of the trial um, know that that's a critical part of fighting 
police violence in this city in particular. Um, we can't move forward unless we have community control, um, in my opinion. Uh, I don't think that a lot of the other proposals that are being put forth are meaningful in any way to um, control police violence. I don't think that they're robust enough and I don't think that they um, taking into account the massive amount of power that the police have. Um, and so I think that we, we are really pushing um, for community control right now. Um, as to the feeling um, on the ground, I think, I think someone else asked me like, do you feel optimistic or do you feel pessimistic about like the future um, following the trial? And I said, I don't know that I really understand how to answer that question because it's not about pessimism or optimism. It's, we have to fight, like we have no choice. What else are we supposed to do? Allow a hostile military force to occupy our city are we supposed to allow the police to continue to murder us? Um, and so I think I think the vibe is just we have to keep going. Absolutely, and um, I I think part of what I was trying to get at about the feeling was the response to the murder of Dante Wright and how that has obviously led to a resurgence of the movement, certainly in Brooklyn Center, where there have been continual nights of very vociferous and and militant protests, um, but also throughout the Minneapolis metro area, maybe you could kind of tell us what the climate has been like since his murder. Yeah, I think for context, Brooklyn Center is a mostly black neighborhood um, or suburb. And I think that black youth right now are really just have no, they have no no recourse to express like how watching this play out time and time again is making them feel. And I think that the quote unquote rioting and looting um, is happening because nothing has been done to address the past time that this happened. There's still trauma that people are dealing with from Philando. People are still dealing with the trauma from Jamar because none of those murderers faced any consequences. The only officer that's ever faced consequences for murdering someone was Muhammad Noor. Um, and that's because he murdered a white woman, point blank period. It's not that people want to be out here destroying things for fun. It's that no one is listening to black people in this city and black people have tried it the other way. Um, so I think what I was getting at in the question about the feeling among organizers was a particular emphasis on how things have changed in the um, week and a half or so since the murder of Dante Wright. And uh, of course, there have been um, many nights of fierce militant protest in um, the, the suburb where he was murdered, which is Brooklyn Center. Um, but I know there's also been protests around the Minneapolis metro area. So maybe you could share with us kind of what that climate has been like. Yeah, um, Brooklyn Center is mostly black people that live in Brooklyn Center. Um, and I think that the youth that are down there and like the people in general that are down there, but I think that this has been really hard for young people to watch and to kind of grow up in this. Um, I think that people, don't see anything being done and they're just being handed kind of platitudes by our governor by our black police chief as though that means something significant for policing um being better in our city um i think that people are really sick of watching this happen over and over and not getting any any justice whatsoever not even kind of like step storage justice um, and I think that the vibe in Brooklyn Center is that people, people can't go home after this. How are they supposed to go home and hang out in their house knowing that they could leave the next time and get stopped for a bogus traffic stop 
and die in the process of getting booked for that. I think that that's, I don't think that people fully understand how psychologically difficult that kind of knowledge is to live under. And I think that every single black kid and teenager and teacher and person that lives in Brooklyn Center um, feels that, that that could happen to them at any, at any moment. Um, so I think that people are militant because they have no choice. Um, there, there just has to be, something has to actually come of this um, for people um, for once, I think. Absolutely. And, um, and I think it's, it's worth remembering that um, the coalition that both of our guests, that, um, that Jay Yates and Justin Sundin are active in, is called the Twin Cities Coalition for Justice for Jamar, referring to Jamar Clark, who was murdered in 2015. And of course, uh, there's more recently been the murder of Philando Castile in 2016. So there's a continuing history just in your city alone, not to mention the whole country of racist murders by police of black people and, and other people of color. Um, so let me turn to um, our other guest, to Jess Sundin, to talk about, um, You've been in, in, well, the progressive movement for 30 years in general, but specifically the movement against police terror for, um, for quite a, a big chunk of that time. So what have you observed as far as um, changes in the movement over that period of your involvement and, and both positive and if, I don't know if there's any negative changes, but it's just sort of the larger trends, both, um, you know, from your vantage point as a, as a, radical leftist um, within um, communities of color, but uh, for you as a white person, how do you see that changing in the white community? So <clears throat> um, here in the Twin Cities, um, Minneapolis is one of, it's Minneapolis and St. Paul, we call it the Twin Cities. And then that includes all the suburbs too. But here in the Twin Cities, there are a couple dozen families who are very outspoken, whose loved ones have been killed by police here. Um, and we know them and we know their stories, but most of them didn't have the experience of everyone knowing their loved one's name when they were killed. Um, to Mark Clark was the first time that everyone knew what happened. And the reason that everyone knew what happened to Jamar Clark is because well, first, there were about two dozen witnesses to his murder. It happened right outside of um, like a club and there was two dozen black people who watched it happen. Um, and despite what they witnessed, the county attorney found them, found the officers uh, unprosecutable um, and in fact, you know, defended them to the public. Then, um, you know, after that it was, just barely a year later that Philando Castile was murdered. And well, actually in the case of Jamar, what happened when he after he was killed, this, uh, in addition to there being all those witnesses, it was where he was murdered is about a block or two blocks from the police precinct. And the community decided to occupy the police precinct. And in fact did so for, I believe it was 18 days. Um, and in Minnesota in November, that's no joke uh, to occupy outdoors uh, for 18 days, but people did. During the occupation, white supremacists came and shot and injured five of the black protesters who were part of the occupation. But Jamar's, the struggle for justice for Jamar was the first time that the whole city was aware of and understood the significance of police violence against black people in our city. And when I say the whole city, yes, it was black people were at the forefront. The neighborhood it happened in is a predominantly black neighborhood. Jamar was black, but the whole city was there. Um, that's the first time we saw Asians for black lives in the Twin Cities. Um, it's when we first started hearing from Native Lives Matter, which established itself as an organization here around that same time. The Somali community came out in big numbers to support justice for Jamar and white folks did too. 
We had a similar kind of response when Philando was killed. When Philando Castile was killed, his, the aftermath of his murder was filmed by his partner, Diamond Reynolds. And many people saw the video uh, with her and her daughter, Day Day, in the car. Um, and his killer was, all, was prosecuted, but found not guilty. And, but it, it was widely known, partly because Philando was a beloved community member in that in particular, he worked in a school and um, elementary kids in his school called him Mr. Phil. He worked in the cafeteria and he got to know all the kids' names. He knew their allergies and whatever else too. And he made sure the kids always had what they needed to eat at lunch. So he was, he was beloved. Uh, he was a union worker too. His union came out, to, came out in support of him. But the young people occupied outside the governor's mansion um, after Philando's murder. Um, and the case was prosecuted, first time that we had seen that in the Twin Cities, um, but his killer was found not guilty. And then we've had other killings, um, but no movements of the same kind of scope and size since 2016. And then when George Floyd was killed, uh, well, I know that your listeners in New York um, also stood up and you know rose up with us for justice for George Floyd, the whole world did. I have family in Australia who did. Um, and it wasn't only that George was murdered, but he was tortured for a very long time. And there was a dozen people begging for his life. And regardless, four officers um, chose to take his life from him that day. And a huge, the, the biggest movement I've ever seen erupted in response to that. Part of it is I think the slow building over time of uh, from Jamar to Philando, some of the folks that were most active in those two movements stayed active. The broader community kind of fell away, but we started to build up lasting organizations. And when George was killed, the outrage on the one hand was overwhelming, but also we had organizations prepared to hit the streets. And that's what we did the first March. I think it was 20 and it could have been 30,000 people. Um, and that we marched from where George was killed to the precinct, um, which now stands in uh, rubble, uh, which as I hope one day all police precincts are, um, but we had a, an incredible response. And the things that have changed sort of over the course of, and since summer, beautiful, amazing things have happened. I got to meet Jay um, this summer, um, and Jay is one of many people that joined our organization. But um, we have this amazing new generation of leaders that have come forward um, that are amazing speakers. They do amazing security at the demonstrations. They're really principled. I almost swore, but I stopped. They're really principled. Um, like, uh, you know, like all movements, this movement also has, you know, opportunists. We also have Democrats who try to get get what they can out of it. And the young people that are leading this movement with us right now see through all of that and, um, and they're not fooled. And so I think what we have now is the strongest I've ever seen in this movement. And it's, it's the strongest movement I've ever been a part of. As a white person, which you asked me to address, you know, this is a black led movement um, and there, there are many white people in it. Minnesota has a lot of white people. Um, some might say too many, uh, which would be fair. Um, it's a tough place to live if you're not white because it's overwhelming, I think. Um, and I think that one thing that's incredibly positive that have come, has come out of this last almost year of struggle is that white folks who um, had been able to look away have not been able to look away. And then ultimately people had to choose a side and it's really, the young people that laid siege to the third precinct of the Minneapolis Police Department that called the question, who, which side are you on? And um, I'm glad to say that there are, you know, a good number of white folks that have, have joined the ranks of this movement, um, but it, it remains, I think, really importantly, a movement that is Black-led. And of course, in a place like Minnesota, we also have a really important leadership role for Indigenous folks who are also killed extremely high numbers here where we live.
All right. Well, all of that oh, is yeah, definitely. You're going to have to edit that. Sorry. No, no, no problem. No, it, sound, it sounded fine. Okay. Um, so, all right. That's, uh, those are some encouraging signs of uh, the movement's growth and development. Um, so now I want to turn to the question of the role of LGBTQ plus people in the movement. And um, of course, out FM is as an intersectional analysis. And so we never look at any issue just solely through the prism of how does this affect uh, queer people. Um, and that's why we're, we're going to continue the rest of this interview to focus on the larger issues around um, police terror. But we do want to include in the questions we examine um, the role of queers. And so uh, our co-host co Sahamili Map has a question. Yes, thank you, Bob. I was, I was glad that you raised the point, uh, Jess, about uh, uh, young people, it's a youth movement organ organized um, by and with them. So my interest was um, for either you or Jay to answer um, possibly, Jay, what the involvement of the queer Black youth has been in terms of mobilizing and uh, keeping the movement going, um, and even in terms of the leadership of the movement. You know, are, are, are queer youth, Black queer youth particularly, um, in Minnesota involved? Yeah, um, absolutely. Black queer youth are leading the movement. Um, there are, I mean, I think, I think that Black people right now are maybe being forced to reckon with that, like, there have always been Black queer people. And mm -hmm. I think that there, there has been a lot of tension um, with that, in my opinion. Um, I remember when I first uh, was um, working with DC for J um, for Pride this year, which actually is a little bit of backstory. I had been to TC for J's um, kind of anti-corporate pride um, event like the first year that I moved here for school. Um, and I was very disillusioned with <laughs> the pride parade that I saw. And then I saw all of these people with this giant banner um, basically disrupting the parade. Um, and so I joined in, walked behind them. Um, and that was like my first TCC for J experience. Um, and so that's part of why I decided to join is that I feel that that action really demonstrated that TCC for J understands that um, black oppression and queer oppression are interlinked um, and uh, both have the same, the same root cause um, of white supremacy and capitalism. Um, but I think that there is sort of a, um, maybe we'll call it a learning curve for some um, Black people that are kind of maybe have been in the movement before um, and really come at it from a maybe Judeo-Christian kind of lens. I think that there's been pushback to um, having openly um, queer people lead the movement. But I think at this point, we're kind of like, we've been here. I don't, I don't know what to tell you about it. Um, it's mm. just, it's, it's a lack of understanding of, of black, um, of black history, really, to think that, that black queer people sprang up because white people did it first. We did that first. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that black queer people have always been involved in the civil rights movement. And I think that that's something that has been that's knowledge that has been taken from a lot of, of, of Black people. Um, they, they simply just don't know that um, and have actively been, I think information about the past of our movement in general has been actively stolen from, from Black people. And so, yeah, there's definitely tension. Um, there's definitely um, a lot of those same opportunists that Jess mentioned are um, homophobic, transphobic, misogynists. Um, but I think it's been really encouraging to see um, specifically like young black queer women um, absolutely refuse to take any of that. Um, they are um, very vocal um, and are not afraid of, of confronting it when they see it. 
Um, and there's been incidences of, of that in Brooklyn Center where they've literally kind of run, <laughs> run people that were, um, that were disrespecting them out of the protest. Um, mm. So I think that there is, there is sort of a militancy that I really appreciate um, in, in the black queer youth. Uh, and I, it's militancy that I think I help create um, occasionally. <laughs> Excellent. But, uh, yeah. Good. Excellent. Jess? Jess, you had, to, you had some yeah, responses. Jess Sunday. Well. Yeah, add something that that's all right. And I think it would be of interest to your listeners that I have found to be a very strange twist of events here. During the trial of Derek Chauvin, the police chief of Minneapolis testified, and I believe he was the one, but it could have been one of the other 5,000 cops that testified, because apparently, the thin blue line Chauvin is just one step on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of police testified against him and I believe it was the chief um, was talking about how like great and awesome and forward thinking our police department here is and how they've really transformed themselves and specifically identified that their amazing work with or policies about trans, the trans community um, which I have never heard from a single trans person. I am not trans, but like, it was like made up. It was just mm -hmm. by the same token, the um, county sheriff here is, I believe he's Lebanese of origin, but he's gay. And that was certainly part, you know, there was definitely like the rainbow people were all about voting for Hutchinson when he ran for sheriff. And now he and his deputies are some of the leading edge of repression in the Twin Cities right now. And so there's also been this attempt to kind of use or pit the LGBTQ community against the Black Lives Matter movement or the movement against police terror. And I think people like Jay and the experiences that they're describing are why that's failed. Like um, for one, um, we have especially Black youth, but other queer people who've been yelling at all of the white queer people who've been trying to ignore police violence ever since Jamar was killed. We've been fighting about it inside the whole queer community. Um, but then also right now it's very evident that we have queer people, especially queer young people on the front lines and the people that are against them are um, either claiming to be the friends of the trans community or actually promoting themselves as some sort of gay sheriff icon. So it's just been a very strange time to see law and order try to kind of pinkwash themselves. Mm. So, yeah. And again, we're speaking with two local organizers in Minneapolis, Jay Yates, a black trans organizer and Jess Sundin, a white lesbian organizer. And both of them are among other things involved with uh, the Twin Cities Coalition for Justice for Jamar, that's Jamar Clark, who was murdered by police in 2015, and that goes by the acronym that you've heard mentioned, TCC4J. And um, let me ask, um, uh, let, let me ask Jay, since um, Jess mentioned that the police chief is bragging about the uh, alleged, uh, you know, forward thinking reforms that have been made in their policy, the police's policy towards the trans community as a black trans person. What, what is your view of uh, that statement? I mean, the DFL tries to do this too. So and, and it's not about the DFL, um, the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. Um, so Democrats, basically. Uh, they, they do this too, where they, they try to, um, to position themselves as though they're allies to, um, the LGBTQ community. Um, they try to recruit, um, LGBTQ people, um, to join their ranks because they know that that's the, um, that's kind of the issue du jour for a lot of people, um, is, is sort of gay rights and like, that's great, but um, regardless of how many trans people you recruit into policing or how many trans council members you put on the city council, um, 
they are serving a racist white supremacist system. They exist in this system to make it work, not to dismantle it. And so I think that a lot of people are very aware of that um, in our movement right now. I think that they've seen it enough and they've seen how much it doesn't matter to have a, a black man as the chief of police and how little it matters to have a black trans woman as one of our city council members. Andrea Jenkins has done very little to actually advance the rights of um, anyone actually, but <laughs> least of all um, queer people. Uh, and so I think that like identity politics are really on their way out. Um, and I'm really hopeful that uh, people, people are seeing that you have to have a deeper analysis than just, oh, this person represents me. Oh, I'm getting I'm getting political representation because this person looks like me, or they um, they're a Democrat, so they must be good. Like they must be a real leftist. Like I think people are realizing that that doesn't make any sense, and that um, these people that are kind of in positions of power are there to maintain those positions of power and maintain systems. And so I think I think the youth are really are really clued in. Um, and don't, and like Jess said, don't fall for it. All right. And um, just for, for those who may not be clear, since um, Jay Yates, you used the term identity politics, you said it's on the way out. And of course, that has a very tortured history as a term, um, because it was actually coined originally by the Black lesbians of the Combahee River Collective in the 1970s. And it was at that time, a positive term to talk about <laughs> Uh, oppressed communities um, unifying based on their shared identity of people subjected to oppression, and they would stand together, unify, and fight for their rights. Of course, it's now by the right wing and many other forces, and by liberals, uh, some liberals, been turned into its exact opposite, which is, and maybe rather than my giving my definition, why don't you say, since you use the the expression that it's on its way out, what you mean by identity politics. Yeah, I see identity politics as, as having been morphed from its original idea. It's, it's a lot like how people have started to misuse intersectionality, um, where they, they don't fully understand the origin of the term and then twist it to their own gains. And I think that our political representation has really um, done a lot of that uh, by co-opting kind of the language of our movements. And so when I say identity politics, I mean when people assume that just because a person is Black that they have to have good politics on Black issues, that they, that they understand intersectionality, that they, um, that they have a good political grounding in um, the situation that they, that they should be listened to. Um, regardless of what actually comes out of their mouth. And so um, I think that there's a lot of that in our movement right now, um, but I also think that people are starting to recognize it for what it is, and it is an incomplete way to um, build political coalition. It's not enough to have an oppressed identity. You have to also understand the nexus of oppression that you exist in, and you have to understand how you relate to other oppressed people. It's not just enough for you to know that you are oppressed and be oppressed. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I mean by identity politics. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Samili? Um, kind of interesting, because I was going to ask you if you, if, uh, I mean, your AG in Minnesota is, uh, Keith Ellison, black man, um, has put forth some a few uh, progressive thoughts I've heard uttered from his mouth. Uh, so I wonder if you if you do you get any backing or you know I mean people as you were saying Jess are sort of seeing this this uh, the the uh, Chauvin um, uh, trial as some sort of milestone in terms of. Uh, the way the police, we, we may have broken the, the blue code and all of that business, um, the blue wall and that, all of that business. So they, they're saying that this, this is forward thinking 
And I've heard some people actually saying, well, that's because, you know, the AG out there is black men. Uh, so I was wondering what your, 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 both your perspective is on that. Does he give you any kind of support in the, uh, at the grounds, you know, grassroots level? Are you hearing anything from, from, from that level of government to support the work that you're doing? Jason, I'm new. I don't know. I've, I've known Keith Ellison um, most of the time that I've lived in Minnesota, so the better part of 30 years. Um, he used to be a radical, maybe even a revolutionary. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, how far he's fallen? Uh, he's not. Um, he, I don't know if he aspires to higher office or not, but he acts like someone who does. Um, his latest sort of shocking contribution to justice in Minnesota was to um, journalists here filed an injunction, tried to get a temporary injunction against police who were um, firing on them for who were covering the demonstrations and the police response. Many of them have been injured and arrested and detained and um, had their equipment damaged as well. So they f tried to file a restraining order against the police and it was L A.G. Ellison who uh, filed arguments against the free press um, and on the side of the police. And um, I'm glad to say that a judge thought better of it and sided with journalists. Unfortunately, police ignored that judge's decision and continued to violate the rights of not only community members, neighbors, protesters, medics, but also still journalists. So um, we have a long list of grievances with um, A.G. Ellison. I would say I've watched the trial pretty closely. I think they've put on a serious case against Derek Chauvin, um, which before we watched it, we were all holding our breath. And I think it was a solid process. I'm not a lawyer, but I think it was a serious effort to, to, to con get a conviction. Um, so I can say that positive about his contributions today. But wouldn't you say, Jess, and, and also Jay, like any opinions you have, that that strong performance in the Chauvin trial is, pro wouldn't you say that's largely um, fueled or motivated by the massive street uprising starting last summer and going on for months so that uh, combined with the just absolute blatant and un unrebuttable nature of the video that no human being with a heart could look at that video and say, well, I'm not so sure. I, I don't really know if he killed, if he, it was murder. Yeah, I, I think that there are a lot of white people in Minneapolis still that think that um, people are that Chauvin is being prosecuted out of like the goodness of someone's heart. Um, and I 100% believe that if there hadn't been a massive uprising, this would have gone the same way that every other police murder has gone where they either do a really bad job at prosecuting and the person doesn't get convicted or they just don't prosecute at all. Um, there's been what, like 400 and something police murders um, in the, since, I don't remember what this, what the statistic was. I think it was since 2000. 2000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 2000, yeah. Um, there's been like 400 something murders um, and there's there's been one conviction. <laughs> That's um, horrifying. And I think that that pattern would have absolutely continued if there hadn't been um, an uprising. I think, I think that there is sort of a feeling in some ways that even though there has been, you know, effort to put forth real evidence that, you know, Chauvin did this um, on purpose, it wasn't an accident. Um, I do think that in some ways it does still feel like a show trial, just, just simply because we know that they wouldn't have put it on if they weren't worried about people rioting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, in fact, um, Chauvin had 
had reached a plea agreement with our county attorney while the uprising was still happening before any charges had been brought against him. And it was strangely federal attorney general Barr who stopped the plea deal because it um, involved the federal government because of the what the agreement, the content of where Chauvin would serve his time. Um, so in fact, the only reason there's a prosecution is because uh, AG Barr said, I don't, I don't think that that, it was a, a lower charge, of course. And uh, Mr. Barr said, I, I don't, I don't think that people would think that was a serious enough charge. <laughs> like, um, so if, if Trump's attorney general could see that it has to be taken seriously, I'm not surprised that our attorney general, who um, is a, has a, a past as a progressive and even revolutionary um, Muslim black man in Minnesota, uh, I, he ought to be able to see it too. Um, I think the other thing that, it, it, the, the kind of a two part strategy with the trial in my opinion, one is to try to get some sort of, Chauvin is a sacrificial lamb. All the cops are also saying he's the only one like this. We had, we would, none of us would ever do this despite that he had done this multiple times. He's a serial killer. He's involved in five other police murders before this, um, despite all that, the other, so they want us to think that the policing is fine, it's just one bad cop. And that's, I think, one thing the trial is supposed to prove. And their other part of their strategy is this massive mobilization of police, National Guard, State Patrol, DNR officers. I guess we have State Patrol coming from Ohio and God knows where else. There are thousands of additional um, police uh, forces here in the Twin Cities. Uh, there's like uh, National Guard trucks with the soldiers in full gear with their long guns, like on all the big streets in the city, like a block from my house. Um, and they've been here all week. Um, they were here before, they first came at the beginning of the trial, but they've been amping up through the course of the trial. And of course, with the murder of Dante Wright, um, they really got to practice the full force of, uh, the full use of force of that operation against um, protesters and community members. So they have a two-pronged strategy, like try to sacrifice Chauvin and see if that quiets the masses. And if it doesn't, um, we'll brutalize them and arrest them and try to quiet them that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just sorry as context, like the response is part of this thing called Operation Safety Net. Um, and I think it's important for people to know that name. Um, but it's been like a coordinated effort to um, suppress the protests, like Jess said. Uh, but it is like an actual, it's like an actual thing that they're like trying to market to people as well as this positive um, force for good or whatever in our communities. And we care about keeping small businesses safe and we care about not having people um, in neighborhoods be affected by unrest, which they say this as they pretty much bomb apartment buildings with um, flashbangs and, and tear gas like mm -hmm. every night. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's a coordinated effort that they've that they're trying to market to the public as um, their effort at keeping the public safe. Well, we're uh, moving to the last few minutes of this interview. So um, let me uh, ask the final question of both of you as to where the movement goes from here and um, particularly since the bulk of our audience is uh, in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area. How can people not in Minnesota um, show their support for the black community, other communities of color that are um, continue to be victimized by police terror? So which, whichever of you would like to start. Um, and you know, so what, what's on the, I mean, after whatever the verdict is in the, in the Chauvin trial, What's next for the movement? What? Uh, well, let me throw in one other factor that people may remember last summer, that the Minneapolis City Council passed a resolution that was ballyhooed by liberals across the country as the first step towards defunding the police and you know a fundamental restructuring of the role of police in public safety. And there, it would be changed, I believe, to a public safety department, no longer called the police. And um, that's been now shown to be largely a sham. But um, in terms of the political agenda of the, of the movements that you are part of, 
the um, particularly the Twin Cities Coalition for Justice for Jamar and any other um, groups against police terror, what's on the agenda, what's next, and how can people help? I'll say a little bit about national, and I know that Jay would love to talk to you about our amazing city council in Minneapolis and lo local initiatives around policing. Um, we're also, our group is, our local group is part of the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. And the National Alliance has, you know, been mobilizing around, uh, there have been many mobilizations around since George Floyd was killed, um, including there is plans for emergency responses in cities across the country to the verdict in solidarity with whatever happens in Minneapolis. Um, people can learn more about the National Alliance at their website, which is naarpr.org. But the National Alliance is doing ongoing work in cities across the country and nationally, not only responding to egregious police murders like that of George Floyd, um, not only supporting activists who experience repression, like hundreds who were arrested in Louisville after Breonna Taylor's murder, um, but also has a long-term agenda to fight for community control of the police and to um, win the release of the wrongfully convicted from prison. Um, it's sort of a, and the National Alliance is a black led, left led formation. Um, and we're just like one chapter of it here in Minneapolis. But I know that there is a chapter in New York. I don't know if they're folks in New Jersey or other nearby communities, but I would encourage folks to link up with the National Alliance. Um, and I know for us, um, it's sort of this, we're kind of walking on two legs all the time, looking for legislative sort of concrete demands that we can bring to government that will make changes for the future and also standing with the families of stolen lives to get justice for their individual loved ones whose lives have already been taken. And I think our work will continue to look like that. And I think that's what people across the country should be doing in terms of their framework overall. Okay, thank you. And, and the National Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression, again, uh, their website is naarpr.org. And I'll give you, um, uh, Jay Yates, the last word. Um, I think that next steps for us uh, in Minneapolis, I think that regardless of the outcome of the trial, we're really committed to community control and seeing it um, happen because we think that it's part of a larger project of getting self-determination and self-determinative power into Black communities, um, and that that is critical to Black lab, Black liberation. Uh, and so I think that that's, that's what we're going to focus on, regardless of how the trial turns out. But I think um, people... I think that for people who are maybe not in Minneapolis or even people that think of themselves as liberals, I would say that I really want them to start interrogating what these liberal politicians um, and nonprofits are saying to them. Um, specifically in Minneapolis, we've had a lot of campaigns like you mentioned um, that are sort of about uh, rebranding the police. Um, and touting that as some sort of meaningful reform. And I think it's really important that people don't allow themselves to be placated by that or taken in by that, and that they continue to actually demand real um, concrete measures to, to rein in the power of police to enact brutalism on, on communities. And so I think I've really, I've really been trying to educate people in my life about things that sound good, but don't actually have any meat to them. Um, and I think that that's sort of my, my ask to the world is um, to be aware of what you, what you support. Okay, and we're gonna have to leave it there. I wanna thank our guests. Uh, Jay Yates is a black trans organizer and Jess Sundin is a white lesbian organizer. They're both active with uh, the, um, Twin Cities Coalition for Justice for Jamar, that's Jamar Clark, um, and other uh, organizations working against police terror in um, Minneapolis, the state of Minnesota, and, and um, uh, nationwide through the um, National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. Uh, thank you very much for coming on Out of Fem from Minneapolis. And um, I wanna thank uh, 
uh, co-host Sahami Lee Mapp, as well as our engineer and producer, John Riley, uh, for your work. And um, uh, that wraps it up for tonight's edition of Out FM. Uh, tune in again next week at 8 p.m. Tuesday for another edition. And till then, stay strong and stay proud. Good night. Great. Okay. Brilliant. Both of you did.